alamin wa usalli wa usallimu ala man ba'itha rahmatan lil alamin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alhamdulillah just making sure you're awake uh, the topic of today's reminder is about Muhammad the messenger of Allah the messenger of mercy sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran he says wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin that we did not send you except as a mercy to the world we didn't send you except as a mercy for the world. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is our noble messenger that was sent to the whole of mankind. But as Muslims, we hardly know anything about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah jalla wa ala tells us in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell them, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. This is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's told us a way of how to achieve the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody claims to have love of Allah. Everybody claims to have love of Allah. In fact, the Muslim claims that. The Christian claims that. The Jew claims that. The Hindu claims that. Everybody claims that they love God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is giving us a test here. That if you truly love Allah, then follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you find that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulallah, I love you more than everything else in the world except for my own self. I love you more than everything in the world except for my own self. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, not yet Umar. In other words, you have not reached the sweetness of Iman. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he thought, he contemplated, and he thought to himself, he realized that actually I would give my life for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So he says, Ya Rasulallah, I love you more than everything else, including my own self. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Al-ana ya Umar, now you have reached the state, a higher state of Iman. And the Prophet ﷺ explained this. He said, man kunna fi wajada halawat al iman." There are three things that if a person finds inside of himself, he has tasted the sweetness of iman. And the first thing he said was what? An yakun Allahu wa rasuluhu ahabba ilayhi mimma sawahuma. That Allah and His Messenger ﷺ are more beloved to him than everything besides them both. The Prophet ﷺ also said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين. That none of you has iman. He negated iman. None of you has true faith until I am more beloved to him than his son, than his child, his father, and the whole of mankind. But the sad reality of affairs in the Muslim Ummah is when we look at the Ummah we find how far we are from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's a very clear indication of our love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because if you love Allah then do what? do what? follow, follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's a simple indication so implicitly, what does that mean? If you don't follow the Prophet ﷺ, that means you don't love Allah Jalla wa'ala. 
And this is a real test for us. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء Islam began as something strange. And it will end as being something strange. So give glad tidings of Tuba to the strangers. Give glad tidings of Tuba. And Tuba is a tree in paradise. It will take a horse rider many, many years to traverse its shadow. And on that day, we will need the shade of this tree. So, Islam is going to be something strange. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that how a time will come when Islam is strange. And the sunnah of Rasulullah ﷺ is going to be strange. But if you are strange in the sense that you, your axiom is the sunnah of Rasulullah ﷺ, then you have tuba. You have tuba. So when we look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we find that he went through a lot of hardship. We did not become Muslims. We are not Muslim except through, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace, the sacrifice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He persevered. And we find that he was actually tortured when he first get, got the message of Islam and he was commanded to tell others about Islam. He was tortured. Both Physically and mentally. As for the mental torture, he was called a soothsayer, a liar, a magician, somebody who's been possessed by a jinn. He was called a sorcerer, all of these things. He was called all of these things, but yet he persevered. Today we are given names, extremists. You know, this name, that name, we immediately reject the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because we don't want this label upon our heads. If a person, he prays five times a day in the masjid, he's extreme. He's completely extreme. He grows a beard, she wears niqab, she wears hijab, extreme. But yet the axiom of moderation, because we are an ummah and wasata, we are a... Middle nation, as Allah Jalla wa Ala describes us. كَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And likewise, we made you a middle nation. And what is a middle nation? Is it middle in what people consider to be middle? No. Middle is what the axiom is, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so we find... That the Prophet ﷺ, he was tortured both mentally and physically. In fact, people would be stationed at the outskirts of Mecca, such that if, on the main roads of Mecca, such that if people were to come from outside, they would warn them immediately before they could even hear the message of Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. Don't listen to that man, he's a liar, he's a soothsayer, magician, sorcerer. You'll be mesmerized by his speech. Don't even listen to him. And today we find the same kind of you know, attitude against the Muslims. We find the media of that time did whatever the media of today is doing. And the media of that time were the poets. The poets, they would, they would write beautiful poetry, but against Allah's Messenger wasallam. And he was also to tortured Physically, we know the famous incident when the Prophet ﷺ was standing by the Kaaba. He was praying by the Kaaba. And he used to pray between the Yemeni corner and the Black Stone. And he was praying because at that time the Qibla was what? Jeru Jerusalem, Baytul Maqdis. And so that was the direction. So he used to keep the Kaaba between him and Baytul Maqdis. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he was praying by the Kaaba and he was in sajda. And Abu Jahl, he got up and he says, Who among you has got the courage 
to go and get a carcass or an intestine of a dead animal from the scrapyard of Mecca and bring it back and throw it on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of them, he got up. He got up and the Prophet sallallahu was praying. He got up, he went to the outskirts of Mecca to where this scrapyard was. And he picked up this carcass and he brought it back to Mecca. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was still praying. Look at his prayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he threw it on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such that the Prophet sallallahu fell over. And the mushrikun of Mecca, they laughed. They got so much enjoyment and pleasure out of this, they laughed loudly. And the narrator of this hadith, he says, by Allah. Oh, before that, Fatima radiallahu anha was told. And she was a girl, maybe five years old, six years old. She came running to her father. Oh, my father, oh, my father. And she helped the Prophet sallallahu clean himself and take this carcass off him. The Prophet sallallahu got up and he says, Allahumma alayka biha ula. Oh Allah, I leave you to deal with these people for what they have done. And you find that the Prophet sallallahu or oh sorry, the narrator of this hadith, he says, in the battle of Badr, by Allah, every single one of them were lying flat on their faces dead. Even in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud, Uqba ibn Rabi' he threw a spear at the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it went through his cheek, such that his molar tooth fell out. Can you imagine the pain? Imagine, you know what tooth pain is like. Even a small, you know, abscess can cause such strong pain. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his a spear went through his cheek. It took out his molar tooth. Molar tooth, not any tooth. His molar tooth. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Did he get up and curse them? What did Rasulullah ﷺ say? He said, How will Allah, he was concerned, how will Allah Jalla wa ala show mercy to a people who have done this? to their Prophet. Allahu Akbar. How will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show mercy to them? This is what he was concerned about. Allahumma ghfir lahum fa innahum qawmun la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive them because they are a people who don't know. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. We get upset over the little quarreling that we have among ourselves. And make it into a big issue. Here, they threw a spear through the Prophet Sallallahu cheek and took out his molar tooth. And yet he was worried. He was concerned. How will Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala show mercy to these people? We all know the story of Taif, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he went to Taif. And Taif is no easy journey. In today from Mecca. It takes you maybe about an hour to get to Taif. Because you get to, if you go by road, by car, you go to Taif, and at the bottom, on the way, there's a, there's a huge mountain. And just to get up that mountain, it takes about 20 minutes by car. You get, finally get to the top, and you're in a place called Hadda. From Hadda, it's another 15, 20 minutes to get to Taif. So the Prophet ﷺ undertook this journey for no other purpose except to call the people to La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And what was he met by? He was met by a people who they did not throw stones at the Prophet ﷺ, but they got their children to throw stones at the Prophet ﷺ to increase the humiliation. Not the youths, but the children of the people of Taif. They chased out the Prophet ﷺ by stoning him. And he was stoned until he ran out. He was chased out of the city of Taif. And when he got to the outskirts of Taif, he sat down. And Jibreel, the angel Jibreel came to 
him and said, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. He said, wa salam ya Jibreel. He said, I have come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me. And he has told me that all you have to do is say yes. And I have come with the angel who is in charge of the mountain. All you have to do is say yes and he will lift up the mountain and crush the people of Taif below this mountain. Think about this for a second, brothers and sisters. Think about this. He has walked out of a city. He's been chased out of a city. Stones pelted. His sandals covered in blood. What does the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa reply? He had every right to get revenge. This is not any ordinary person. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's carrying the message of Allah. He didn't come for a worldly purpose. He had every right to seek revenge. And Allah Jalla wa ala gave him not only the permission, but he sent an angel to do this job. And his sandals were covered in blood. What did he reply? He said, No, O Jibreel. Instead, even though these people were not guided to Islam, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide their offspring to Islam. Perhaps they will be saved from the hellfire. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This is the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is why Allah jalla wa ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except as a mercy to the world. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we look at the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that he went out on a dark night, but it had a full moon. And he saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a red cloak. And he was looking really, really beautiful. So he was looking at the full moon. And then he looked at the Prophet Sallallahu face. Once again he looked at the full moon. And he looked again at the Prophet Sallallahu face. A third time he looked at the full moon. And he looked at the face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, by Allah, the face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more beautif beautiful than the full moon on this night. Anas radiallahu anhu says, I have never touched silk or a silky garment softer than the palm of the Prophet Muhammad nor have I smelt a perfume or any scent nicer than his own scent In fact, Abu Juhayfa said, I took his hand and I put it on my head and I found that it was colder than ice. This is in the desert of Arabia. I found that it was colder than ice and better scented than the musk perfume. Um Sulaim said he, his smell, the scent of Rasulullah sallallahu was more beautiful than the finest of perfumes, the finest of musk. Indeed, Jabir radiallahu anhu says that when the, whoever pursues a road, whoever goes, traverses a path, he will know immediately if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has passed down this path because he could smell the beauty of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his sweat. In fact, some of them, they used to collect the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because it smelled so beautiful and they would use that instead of the finest of musk. In terms of his character, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Aisha radiallahu anha said إِذَا خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ اِخْتَارَ اَيْسَرَهُمَا مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ إِثْمًا أو كَمَا قَالَ That if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the choice between two things he would choose the easiest of the two as long as it is not a sin. 
he would find the easiest way as long as it's not a sin and he knew that people would try you know people want to follow the prophet sallallahu and allah jalla wa ala says لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden a soul except that which it can bear. It can bear that burden. And the Prophet ﷺ would take the easiest of the two choices because he knew that people would follow that and he wanted to make the deen easy for the people. With regards to his generosity, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most generous of all of mankind. And in Ramadan he says, when Jibril used to come to visit him and review the Quran with him, in Ramadan he was like a whirlwind. You know the whirlwind comes and it just takes everything away. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to give everything away in this manner. And Ibn Abbas could not think of any way to describe the generosity of the Prophet except with this statement. So he said he's like a whirlwind. When in fact, Jabir radiallahu anhu said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa never denied something that he was asked for. Can you imagine anybody asking for something? The Prophet sallallahu would give it. Regarding the courage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Many brave people, they would have felt something in battlefield. They would feel, you know, they would have at least one occasion where they would have fled from the battlefield. Except for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali radiallahu anhu, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his son-in-law said, whenever the fight grew fierce and the eyes of the fighters went red, we used to resort to the Prophet ﷺ for succor. And he was always the closest to the enemy. Subhanallah. You don't find him like the leaders of today. When something goes, they're the first in the bunkers. Bomb-proof buildings. Or, no. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ was the closest to the enemy. This was the courage of Rasulullah ﷺ. One night... Anas radiallahu anhu tells us a story of a night when the people of Medina, they woke up and they heard a sound. Now in those days, if you hear this kind of sound, it's desert, right? And it's very quiet. If you hear a sound like this, it means an army is approaching. So the people of Medina, they woke up. They didn't know what, what is the sound. Could it be an army? They woke up. They got out. They came out of their houses slowly, cautiously. You know what they saw? They saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was already on a horse. He had already worn his armor. He took his shield with him. And he was coming back. And he had already gone and he's coming back now. To, he went to check to see is there a problem by himself. And he came back to tell the people of Medina there's nothing to fear. Don't worry. There's nothing to fear. Allahu Akbar. He didn't send somebody else to go out and go and check. No. There was a radio advert once I heard where there's like a husband and wife. I don't know what they were advertising. But there was a husband and wife, they're having this conversation. And they're upstairs in their bedroom. And the man, or the woman says to the man, the wife says to the husband, Hey, there's a thief downstairs. You know, go and have a look. So the man, he replies, the husband says, you go and have a look. He says to his wife, you go and have a look. So she says, but you're the man of the house. He replies, so as man of the house, I order you to go down and have a look. <laughs> okay. But the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi no. He didn't send anybody. There were many courageous young men there. No. He didn't send anybody to go there. Rather... He himself, he got, he wore his armor and he got up and he went by himself. And he came back telling the people of Medina, you have nothing to fear. Even when he would criticize people, it was very rare that he would mention them by name. Instead, he would say, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri talks about him. He said he was more, sh he was shyer than a virgin girl behind her veil. 
He was more modest than the virgin girl behind her veil. And also, he said that when the Prophet ﷺ would never stare at anybody's face. And if he was angry, we would see it on his face. And he would never stare at anybody's face. He always cast his eyes down. He looked at the ground more than he looked up. So in other words, he didn't, you know, walk with a kind of, in a haughty style. He walked in a humble way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he would criticize someone, he would rarely mention their name. Instead, he would say something like, why do so and so? Why do certain people do this? Why do those people do this? You know, he would concentrate on the action itself in a lot of cases. Sometimes, if there was a wisdom, he would mention names. Ali radiallahu anhu had said that Abu Jahl had told Ali that he had told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we do not call you a liar because he was known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy, as sadiq the truthful one. He said, Abu Jahl said to the Prophet sallallahu as Ali reports, he said, we do not call you a liar, but we do not believe, we do not have faith in what you have brought. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is not you that they deny, but it is the verses, the ayat of the Quran that, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the polytheists of Zalimun, uh, they deny. Even Abu Sufyan, when he had to, um, when Abu Sufyan, when he was not a Muslim at the time, and they went to Heraclius, and Heraclius asked him questions, and he said to Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan was with his companions, and they were from the Quraysh, they went to Heraclius to bring back some of the Muslims, right, the Quraysh, Mus Quraysh Muslims and others. And so they went to Heraclius, who was the emperor of Abyssinia. Uh, or sorry, he was the emperor of Persia, I think. And Heraclius said to him, he said, I want to, I want to ask you some questions. And he called Abu Sufyan forward. And he told Abu Sufyan's companions who were behind him. He said, to him, he said to them, if he lies, then you should nod and tell me that he's lying. So now Abu Sufyan has to tell the truth. Abu Sufyan has to tell the truth. And he even says, he says later on, he says, the only reason I told the truth was I was scared that my companions would say that, hey, he's lying. Because, you know, he didn't want them to contradict him. And so the emperor asked them, Heraclius asked him a number of questions. From among them, one of the questions he asked, has Muhammad ﷺ ever lied beforehand? He said, no. Imagine the enemy of Allah at the time. Afterwards, Alhamdulillah, Abu Sufyan became Muslim. Anhu. But at the time, he was the enemy of Muslims. And he went and he had to tell the truth. What is that? He had to say that yes, he's trustworthy. We have to really think about this. Because why is it that our communities, they don't trust, they don't have trust in what we, in, in the Muslims. If you look at the, you know, some of the highest criminal rates in some of the countries, non-Muslim countries, they come from Muslims. Why is it that we have not built a rapport with our communities? That we don't have that, you know, trust. This is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. He had trust of the communities around them. This is something that we really need to ask ourselves. Why is it that they don't come to us when they want to deposit safe things? Why don't they trust us anymore? You find that the Muslims are the first to do the scams. Every scam, the Muslims know first. Right? And this really, really puts... The Muslims, they, it gives the Muslims a very bad name. But the Prophet ﷺ, no, he was trustworthy and the people knew him as such, such that even though they were fighting him, they still trusted him. SubhanAllah. Even when we look at the death of the Prophet ﷺ, there are many, many lessons to learn. We find that the last few days of the Prophet ﷺ's life, he had a fever. 
He had a high temperature. And on one of those days, he asked them to bring cold bags of water. So they brought seven bags of cold water. And they tried to bring the fever of Rasulullah down, bring his temperature down. And then he got a little bit of energy and he went to the masjid. And he said, a servant of Allah has been given the choice between this world and the akhirah. And he has chosen the akhirah. And all the companions, they got happy. A servant of Allah. Some servant of Allah has been given the choice between this world and the akhirah. And he's chosen the akhirah. That's a good thing. All except for Abu Bakr who began to cry. Because he knew that the servant that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was speaking about was himself. And the time for the departure of Rasulullah وسلم, was near. In fact, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was then told to lead the prayer. The Prophet وسلم, told Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to lead the prayer. And the Prophet وسلم, was very insistent on this. Because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he would have so much khushu'a concentration, humility, submission in his prayers, such that the people at the back, they could not hear his voice because he would be crying so much. So they asked for somebody else. In fact, Aisha radiallahu anha asked for somebody else to come and lead the prayer. But the Prophet وسلم, refused. He said, no, Abu Bakr. And this is an indication of the fact that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu will be taking over after the Prophet وسلم, passes away. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was leading the prayer. And the Prophet وسلم, got a bit of energy. And he got up and he went. And in the middle of the prayer, he went out there to go and pray. And this shows the importance of prayer, brothers and sisters. The Prophet وسلم, is on his deathbed. But yet, he forced himself to get up and to go and pray. And the Sahaba, they got really happy. Because the Prophet وسلم, is getting better. So they began to clap, which is allowed in the Salah, in order to inform the Imam. Some of the Sahaba clapped. And, the pro and then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stood back. And the Prophet وسلم, he led, he continued, he led Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr led the rest of the people. And on the last night, last day of the Prophet وسلم, he became... Uh, sorry, at this time, afterwards, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu thought that the Prophet وسلم, is getting better. So because he hadn't seen his family for some time, he had one family, uh, one wife in the outskirts of Medina. So he asked permission from the Prophet وسلم, can I go and visit her now? So he went there to visit his family. And during this time, the Prophet وسلم, his condition worsened. And he had, taught, he had sought the permission from his wives to be able to stay the night, stay in only one of his wives' houses. This is the justice of the Prophet He sought their permission, even though he was incapable of going to all of the wives. So he was with Aisha radiallahu anha. And he had his lap, his uh, head on the lap of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr, Aisha's brother, radiallahu anhuma, walk in. He walks in. And he had a siwak, a tooth stick. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, she knew her husband, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, do you want that tooth stick? The Prophet sallallahu nodded. So she took the tooth stick from Abdurrahman. And she bit the end of the tooth stick to soften it. To moisten it. And she gave it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet sallallahu cleaned his teeth. He was already a very, very clean, extremely hygienic person. He said, At-tahur shatrun, shatrul iman. O kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa Purification is half of faith. So he, was, he would always pay special attention to cleaning himself. But she said, this time, it was like no other time. It was as if 
we're preparing to meet his Lord. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Aisha says, and she used to boast about this afterwards. She said that my saliva and the saliva of the Prophet Sallallahu were joined before he died. Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And at this point, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ar Rafiqul A'la. He said, the companionship of the high one. And Aisha radiallahu anha later on she says, I then remembered the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu had told us that no Prophet, his no Prophet's life is taken until he is given the choice between this world, the companionship of this world or the companionship of the high one. And I knew that he had now made that choice. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he then went on. He said, Ah, ala lil inna lil ala inna lil mawti sakarat. He said, indeed, death has its pangs. Indeed, death has its pangs. And then he closed his eyes and he left this world. Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The news of the Prophet Sallallahu death spread in Medina. There was commotion. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, imagine that the closest person to you has died. We all know people who were with us maybe a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. People that we were really close to and they are no longer with us. Imagine the day that you heard of the death of that person. And now imagine that you have been among Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The person, by Allah's grace, took them out of darknesses into the light of Islam. The person who got them from a nation that were alcohol, wine drinking people who used to kill, murder their female daughters, their daughters, alive. Child infanticide, female infanticide. To a people that, who had a religion which gave honor to both men and women. To a people, he took them from a people who used to worship idols. Can you imagine? To a people who went to the servitude of Allah Jalla wa ala. The person who by Allah's grace unified them as one body. One ummah from a people that used to fight over minor things. Can you imagine that most, the person that you love the most has died? Can you imagine a woman, she walks to the battlefield after one of the battles and she is told, your husband has died. She says, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? She he, she, they said, he is okay, alhamdulillah. She says, then I have nothing to worry about. She continues walking. She's told, your father has died. She says, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, it's, he's okay. She says, I have nothing to worry about then. She continues to walk. She said, he, she, she is told, your son has died. For a mother, her son is the closest person to her usually. She says, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They said, he's okay. She said, then I have nothing to worry about. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was beaten and beaten and beaten until he lay unconscious. Finally, he regained consciousness. And what did he say? What are the first words he said? He said, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My brothers and sisters, they would give up their lives for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you can imagine that this person who is so close to them, who guided them by Allah's grace to Islam, he was among them, the son that was among them, 
the golden era. The fact that the Quran was descending, the revelation was descending, and you are part of that. And that is no more. Can you imagine what they had to go through on that day? That was the biggest calamity, the scholars say. The biggest calamity that faced this ummah was the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so news spread about among Medina. There was commotion. People didn't know what to think, what to know. What is this? Even Al-Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stood outside the masjid. He could not believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away. So he stood up and he had his sword and he said, whoever says Rasulullah sallallahu has died, then I will chop off his head. The Prophet sallallahu has gone to his Lord like Musa sallallahu went to his Lord for 40 days. So this was the commotion that was happening in Medina. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he heard of the news. And he rushed back to Medina. He went straight to the house of his daughter Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He went to her and he lifted her veil and she was crying. And then he went to the side and he saw the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he, took, he lifted the shroud and he kissed the forehead of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he said, how beautiful, how beautiful you are both when you were alive and now that you have died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he covered him and he went to the masjid where Umar radiallahu anhu was still causing the commotion and he said ala rifqiqa ya Umar calm down Umar calm down Umar radiallahu anhu he wasn't interested his most beloved person to him more beloved to him than his wife his son his father and his own self. He had disappeared. He left this stuff. He wasn't interested. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he took control. And he says, Inna alhamdulillah. He started the khutbah. And then people, they left Umar and they came to listen to what does Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu have to say. And he said those powerful words. He said the powerful words. He said, مَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ يَعْبُدُوا مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ Whoever among you used to worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then know that Muhammad has certainly died. وَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ And whoever among you used to worship Allah, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ Indeed, Allah is ever living and he never dies. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he fell down and later on he said it was as if the feet below me had been chopped my legs had been taken away from beneath me and I just the weight of the words that I had just heard I had just realized the reality of what has just been said Abu Bakr then continued he says وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِن مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ Muhammad وسلم, is not but a messenger. Messengers have come and gone before him. If he dies or is killed, will you revert? Will you go back on your heels? Will you go back away? Will you leave Islam? So when the Umar عنه, heard this, he fell down because of the weight of this word. So these are just short glimpses of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of Mercy, the Messenger of Mercy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I advise every single one of us to first and foremost to pick up the Qur'an in a language that you understand. In a language that you understand. And read the Qur'an. Because if you want to know what the character of the Prophet ﷺ is, Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, what was the character of the Prophet ﷺ? 
She said his character was the Quran. He was a walking Quran. Pick up the books. Pick up the book of Allah Jalla wa ala in a language that you understand. And read it from beginning to end. We read so many books in our lifetime. Books at school, at university, books for work. We do so much research. If we want to buy a house, buy a car, buy a mobile phone, buy a laptop, a computer. We look at the reviews, we go online, we check all the different things. We find out what's the best way, what's the best product to buy. But we haven't even read. Many, many people have not even read the book of Allah Jalla wa ala in a language that they understand from beginning to end. They don't even know, we don't even know how to conduct our life. 17 times a day, we ask in every single rakah of every single prayer, we ask, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. But Allah Jalla wa ala has given us the straight path. You just turn over the page. After Surah Al-Fatiha, what is the next surah? Al-Baqarah. Allah says, Alif Lam Mim Dalik al Kitabu La Rai Bafi Hudan Lil Mustaqeen. 17 times a day we ask for guidance. Then Allah says, Alif Lam Mim Dalik al Kitab. That is the book in which there is no doubt. The Quran. What? Hudan Lil Mustaqeen. It is a guidance for the God fearing one. So we ask for guidance, but we don't read the guidance. It's like a doctor. You go to a doctor for a prescription, and you take the prescription, and you put it on the top shelf. Or you wrap it up and you put it in a necklace and tie it around you. Is it going to benefit you? No. You have to go and carry out what it tells you. You have to read it and act upon it. So let us make a resolution that we're going to read the Quran by Ramadan, in a language that we understand. Who's going to fulfill that resolution, inshallah? Put your hand up. Okay, by Ramadan. We have about, I think, three weeks. That's enough time, inshallah, to read the Quran in a language that we understand. And then, inshallah, we shall be purer for Ramadan, such that we can worship Allah Jalla wa ala and attain a higher status. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. So the Prophet ﷺ, so the first thing I say is to let us read the Qur'an. The second thing, practical thing we can do is to pick up the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Any book on the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. al rahiqul Makhtum, the sealed nectar. It's in English now. You pick up any book, about authentic book about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and read it cover to cover. And this will increase us in our love for Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thirdly, the third thing to take away from this, أَطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيءُ الرَّسُولِ Obey Allah and obey the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah tells us this so many times in the Qur'an. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the Messenger gives you, then take it. Whatever he prohibits you from, then leave it. Then leave it. Dear brothers and sisters, when wine was prohibited in Islam, there used to be an alcohol consumer society. Every gathering they would have wine. When the final stage of the prohibition of wine came,